operational uh, keynotes, uh, we want to kick the day off with a, a great panel here on collaboration through public, private, and philanthropic funding. Uh, we'll be moderated by Damien uh, Giorgino um, on my left here, partner at Womble Dixon and, and somebody who's been a, certainly a mentor and, and somebody uh, instrumental in, in bringing together a lot of the, the critical thinking in the water space right now. We have Janice uh, Beecher, uh, professor from Michigan State. Dan Elias from uh, US Water, uh, representing industry, as well as Kendra Morris from industry, and Julie Wachter uh, from Dig Deep on the philanthropic side, and of course, uh, Michael Dean, the chief of the Clean Water State Revolving Fund, representing the, the federal government here and the EPA. So uh, with that, I want to pass it off to Damien. Um, thank you for the discussion. All right, greetings. Um, thank you all for coming here. This I've been a part of this now since 2019 when our first group uh, consisted of maybe 20 participants, 25 participants, and it's grown robustly every year. Um, I'm going to stand up, Alex. I can't sit down. Um, but I've been in the water space for a number of years, far too long, um, and I've seen over the years, let me try this, over the years, a growing interest in water, and I think, in fact, of, to echo some of Peter's comments, we're at a very positive inflection point right now as you look at water, and that inflection point is uh, uh, very important for uh, where we are. Um, to give you some factoids, um, there's no more water on the face of the earth since time began. Uh, you have a fixed supply and an ever-increasing demand, notwithstanding that our per capita usage is going down, we're still using a lot more water. Um, the water system we have right now is, uh, to a certain extent, very broken. In the U.S., the American Society of Civil Engineers gave water infrastructure a D minus. It was the worst of all the infrastructures uh, uh, in the U.S. It's broken, and it needs a lot of money to uh, rehabilitate itself. Just to give you a few factoids, and, and water news, we'll be talking about that, is full of headlines, uh, disastrous proportion headlines. Um, but again, just to put it in perspective, um, in the US, uh, EPA has estimated uh, historically that we need 600 billion of investment in water infrastructure now in the immediate near future. Uh, the estimates of a trillion dollars are probably low. Um, you look at growing economies, Southeast Asia, it's been estimated that by 2050 in Southeast Asia, they will need 36 trillion of infrastructure, water infrastructure investments. Coming back to the United States, uh, broadly writ, we have an issue, and everybody has an issue, quite honestly, around the world, as to what the value of water is. We'll hear from Emma Danmiller from Inoa, where she's doing a lot of work on the value of water, but it all centers around the value of water. Why is it we complain we don't complain about buying a $3.50 bottle of Fiji water that, that has a carbon footprint that is really ugly, yet we complain about our water bill, if you even know what your water bill is, and it's generally less than what you pay for cable TV. Um, we need to, to have a serious discussion about the value of water. Government can't do it on its own. The, the, just the size and scale is too large for water for government to be the investor in those assets. Uh, water by investing by governments right now uh, is is not working the way it should. It's not directing it to the innovation that's needed. It's not directing it to those financing sources to make the system much more efficient. I had the pleasure of being on uh, nominated on the National Infrastructure Advisory Council. We talked about that in some of the earlier uh, folks they had mentioned that. We did a year-long study of the water systems in the U.S. We published our report a couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, excuse me, and you should be able to pick it up online. But the biggest takeaways from that discussion are, number one, we need to raise the awareness of water uh, to everybody. Uh, raising that awareness uh, creates a discussion around water, not unlike what we had with energy. Uh, that was the number one thing. We need to create some centralized 
focused federal level department that can look at water broadly writ. It's water is the only infrastructure that does not have a federal department associated with it. Um, water systems in the U.S., and we'll hear Michael talk about this in a little bit, are funded primarily at the local level through state revolving funds, through WIFIA, through other areas, but we need a, a mechanism to allow more capital to come into the system. The other area that we talked about uh, on the uh, NIAC was the need for consolidation of the water space. There are 54,000 water utilities in the U.S. Why? Uh, city of uh, Allegheny County, Pittsburgh, my hometown, um, there are 101, 131 municipalities. The, the, the county is 40 miles by 40 miles. There are, there are 131 municipalities. There are over 150 water utilities. Why? It's 40 miles by 40 miles. What you're seeing evolve in the water space is a need for uh, rethinking is the wrong word, I say change. Water change is absolutely necessary right now. Change is scary. Uh, we all think of water uh, as something that comes from the tap and it's clean and all that. It's not. We need to rethink how we allocate funds, resources, as well as uh, motives and motivations, incentives to get there. Um, on, my, on my panel today, and, and by the way, I can give you factoids that are, that are kind of crazy and, and uh, just a couple real quick, I can't help myself. Um, going to a centralized water treatment system has been great for health. Um, and we'll, we'll hear uh, Dr. Beecher talk today about uh, how rates are set. But setting rates based on return capital, return on capital, oftentimes leads to more capital being deployed. Um, apologies. Um, to get a return on that capital. The market is moving to distributed water where it's local. When you look at EPA guidelines uh, for water utilities, 100% of all the water that is uh, delivered out of a POTW has to be treated to drinking water standards. You know how much of that is actually ingested by a human? 1%. It's rather inefficient. We're moving towards a, a system that the energy grid went through a long time ago we moved from large centralized systems, we deregulated it. All of a sudden you incentivized investors to come in and we ended up with things called microgrids, eventually distributed energy. Where we're moving now in the water space is to something called distributed water, where water is made locally, delivered locally, the carbon footprint associated with it is, is virtually eliminated and you can secure that that water is safe and, and uh, drinkable. So, what's our panel going to talk about today? Our panel is going to talk about primarily the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Trillion dollars is a lot of money. Federal government can't do it by itself and shouldn't do it. You know, what's the role of government uh, is, is a different debate, but the, the right-hand side of the balance sheet is, is what we are talking about right now and who should fund that right-hand side of the balance sheet. We've talked a little bit about uh, public-private partnerships. Um, I don't know what that means. I really don't. Um, we've talked forever. I used to do privatizations in the, in the 90s. I've been in the water space far too long. Uh, that went out of favor and we went to public-private partnerships. Public-private partnerships, in my mind, have no meaning. It's great to talk about it, but there are so many different variations that it's really, it's just a euphemism for you've got a private party involved in a water system. It can be a consultant that's being called a public-private partnership. We need to get to where real money is invested, risks and returns are allocated properly, and you create a scenario where innovation and efficiencies become important because the systems are broken and we need to move towards that. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Michael, uh, who is at EPA, uh, to talk a little bit about some of the funding that is available from, from the federal government to the states or otherwise. Thank you, Damien. Um, good morning, By the everyone. Way, we're gonna make this thing fun. Okay. I'm gonna I'm try to make, make it fun, make, make water and money fun. So um, you heard, uh, heard from uh, Radhika uh, uh, kick things off uh, this morning for us uh, about the historic investment under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. 
uh, fifty billion dollars uh, going into water over five years, about forty three billion of which is going through the uh, state revolving fund programs. I manage the clean water state revolving fund program. We have a sister program, drinking water state revolving fund program, a little bit uh, newer, uh, a little bit smaller, but um, so. That is the principal mechanism in which the Congress uh, decided to move this historic investment, uh, and we have the responsibility to move that, you know, wisely. Just, uh, just some some kind of context for where federal government spending fits into overall spending. You know, it's never been the biggest. Uh, part of the investment, as, as Damien said. It's the local governments through rates, issuing municipal bonds, repaying uh, SRF loans, um, makes, it, uh, makes most of the investment. Um, but over about the last 34 years of the Clean Water SRF, we've invested about $165 billion in about 46,000 projects. Uh, drinking water is, is again, uh, quite a bit smaller. Uh, and that's supercharged now with an additional 50, uh, $43 billion coming through those programs in the next few years, in addition to our regular annual appropriations that we're getting as well. So we and our state partners are moving very hard, very quickly to, to get that money going. Uh, in addition, we've seen some other uh, interesting uh, uh, investments. Um, WIFIA, uh, a program, a direct loan program from EPA, has been in existence about five years, and over the past five years has, has uh, lent about $20 billion uh, to countries, uh, to communities across the country for total projects of about $40 billion. It funds about 49% of its projects. Uh, the American Rescue Plan Act several years ago as part of the pandemic recovery, uh, their state, state and local recovery funds uh, have a significant investment in water. We were tracking for a while, but about a year ago, we gave gave up tracking how much of that was going into water. It was about $10 billion at the time, and additional grant money going into communities across the country. So we do have this infusion of, of, of uh, capital. Uh, in addition to other programs, U.S. Department of Agriculture has a very significant program people often forget about for rural communities as well, with billions of dollars going in grants and loans. But as I said, you know, it, it's, never, it, it's never the bulk of the funding, but federal funding is important. And I think it, uh, one thing that we can focus on is I think we have a responsibility uh, as a federal government to kind of direct how we should be investing in this country. So we've heard already this morning from Radica about the historic investment and reach out to disadvantaged communities, those who have not benefited from the federal investment in the past. We need to ensure that we are reaching them, and sustainably, that it's not just a one-time infusion of this capital, but institutionally, we've created a framework in which that investment will continue, that those utilities that are receiving the capital investment can maintain those uh, uh, investments in, in, as a sustainable utility and serve people. Um, uh, we can focus on resilience, right? We want to make sure that we're building resilient infrastructure, climate resilient, all hazards, uh, actually, but uh, really focus on, on, on the climate resilience. Uh, more green, uh, you know, look at things more one water standpoint. The clean water SRF in particular, compared to the drinking water, NC Sun's utilities, we fund all sorts of water quality projects, really exciting. More source water protection so we don't have to treat as much, more reuse. Uh, uh, so we don't have to uh, tr uh, obtain as much water as well. So again, that, I think the key for the federal investment is showing how we should be investing, and not as Rack said, just moving the money through the existing systems, very intentionally taking a leadership role, and filling in gaps where other capital can't go, or or being a being a you know being kind of a facilitator to bring in other sources of funding along with it. It doesn't always have to be. I, I'm a big proponent of multiple funding. So not 100% SRF funding, bringing in WIFIA money, bringing in private money, bringing in philanthropic money, whatever is necessary to meet that community's particular goals, we need to be very open to that, and, and we need to really lead that. Yeah, I think the federal government does have a role in doing that um, and setting the policy. I just, uh, you know, I, I get concerned a little bit with um, perpetuating a system that's been going on for 150 years um, and redoing it. Dan? Yeah, and, and uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is obviously how do you reach the communities that are in the most need? Um, communities in uh, central New York, as an example. Uh, aging infrastructure, eroding tax base, um, dwindling population, on the ground assets that need, you know, certainly need a, a, a you know, big investment. Um, from our standpoint, at, uh, you know, trying to be in a position where we can 
bring and add value um, as, as, as we look at some of these communities. It's, it's very, very challenging. Um, navigating the political landscape as well. And so I, I don't know if there's a, you know, there's a, a solution here that kind of, you know, fits every, every community. There's a uniform solution. It needs to be specifically tailored. And I, I just don't know how, how we approach that. Can, can I respond? Back in, so, yeah. um, I work for Veolia um, in the Northeast region of the U.S., and one of the number one requests that we get is, can you please, from municipalities, our municipal partners, is can you please help us access federal funding? And so in New Jersey, we started working with Epic, and I'm sure Epic is here somewhere today, um, to as a funding navigator and helping uh, this one borough in New Jersey is very small and has um, increasing uh, requirements in their new permit for their wastewater system. They're not going to be able to afford it. So what do they do? Um, and connecting them with Epic. But from Veolia's perspective, we're not going to see probably any of those dollars. We're operating and maintaining their system. We're just helping them connect the dots so that then they trust us, right? And we're going to help you try to make sure your system is resilient by connecting you. But the number one question is, how do I access these federal funds? It is so challenging. Challenging. You need consultants, you need a lot of paperwork, you need a lot of patience, uh, and you need to be a good storyteller, right, <laughs> to be able to secure the grant. So it takes a village. Yeah, and let me just kind of set the stage a little bit differently. Um, municipal systems are getting more complex. Uh, if you looked at what happened in Jackson, Mississippi, I, I can show anybody that wants to see it a picture of their maintenance logs in Jackson, Mississippi. The system is very complex. It's a wall of maintenance manuals and logs that is in a state of disrepair. The systems are getting too complex for any municipality, large or small, to do on their own. In my estimation, at least, that's the role of private companies and private capital to run that better. You look at the um, data centers. Data centers are outsourcing energy and water. It's not their business. The large chip manufacturers are outsourcing water, 20% of, of the cost of a chip plant, and these are in the billions of dollars range, or for creating the cleanest water on the face of the earth, and then cleaning up those complex systems. They're outsourcing water because that's not what they make. There's a role for private companies in that regard. And industry, quite honestly, has been at the forefront of outsourcing and turning over their water systems to somebody who is the expert. Um, Maybe, uh, uh, Julie, if you could talk a little bit about your role and, and dig deep in what they do to fill some of these gaps uh, in funding, particularly in, in challenged areas. Yeah, thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Julie Wechter with Dig Deep. We're one of the leading nonprofit organizations serving people in the United States, more than 2 million Americans who don't have running water or sanitation. And I think it's relevant to this discussion, um, some of the research that we recently released last year, which is the massive amount of economic benefits to be had by investing in water and sanitation access in the United States. So we've been talking a lot about the cost of not doing anything, the cost of inaction, which is massive. We found that the US economy is losing over eight and a half billion dollars every year because we're allowing millions of people to live without water and sanitation. So we talk about economic gains. The good thing is that we also found there's a almost five to one return on investment for every dollar invested in first time water and sanitation access. We call that closing the gap, getting everyone water and sanitation, which as Peter Glick mentioned, we can do, right? We live in the United States. This is not anything crazy to ask for to say, okay, we, th we can get everyone water and sanitation and the society as a whole will benefit. I think the interesting part about this discussion is there's a, a, what we call a wrong pockets problem in economics, right? So, so there's a bit of a market failure that says, even though there's these massive return on investments to be had and the entire society will gain, there is a critical role for the federal government, an argument could be made, because no one actor can actually reap all of those benefits, right? Some of those benefits go to households. Some of those benefits go to private businesses. Some go to local, federal, state governments. 
And so all of the economy benefits, all of society benefits, and yet the role for government is in recognizing that no one investor is going to reap all of that. So there has to be that central actor, even as private investment has a major component, a major part in this progress. And yeah, Janice, uh, Janice does a lot with rate setting and, and rate paying, so uh, I'd, li I'd like to hear what you have to say on that. Yeah, so I want you use the term pockets, which I love, so I always say there's only two pockets for which, from which we fund infrastructure, and we've got to get our heads straight. Funding and finance are not the same things. You know, funding, you know, and we only have two ways to fund through our taxpayer pocket or our ratepayer pocket. That's pretty much it. Philanthropy can support capacity development. I'm really glad people are highlighting that, but it's really those two pockets. Those two pockets have very different effects on people. The, you know, taxes can be much more progressive. Rates are always regressive. So when we pay for things through rates, we have a, we have that regressive impact on low-income households. Uh, privatization, uh, you know, we, we, we sort of leap to privatization. And I would also, a little caveat, we don't have 50,000 water utilities, we have 50,000 water systems, which, are, which is very different, it's a very different unit, it's like power plants or gas stations, it's regulated units that, that, that the EPA regulates. And um, a lot of those don't even look like utilities, so you gotta take that off the, the table. When we turn to one, of the, to me, one of the things I've been thinking about is we've moved from a public service model to a public enterprise model. We've moved from a government funding model to a government financing model. We've moved um, from you know funding infrastructure in hybrid ways to a user pays and a full cost pricing model. I actually am starting to think that that has undermined, not supported our social goals. And I think we need to step back, and, and you, you really said it, you know, we need to think, we, we will never get those packets right, so forget about it, right? But, but one of the reasons we pay for things in society, like transportation, right, like us, other kinds of essential services, we pay for those through tax dollars for a reason, and that's because we believe in a level of equity. And, and again, sorry I didn't want to talk, I didn't know I was going to talk about rates today, but um, the, when you propose the private, two things, when you propose the private solution, you will raise the cost of capital on the debt side and the shareholder uh, equity compensation side, so you have to accept that. Um, and I think you would need to think through, you know, you kind of had, a, no offense, a little slight contradiction because you talked about water is local, which we all talk about, um, but then we talk about consolidation in the same breath, so which is it? Water systems operate like microgrids. Let's capitalize on that, and let's think about bringing technology and um, you know, innovation into that space. I think, uh, I think that is re really interesting, and I think it goes to resilience, uh, which we're all thinking about today. Um, but, um, but I think there are, there are ways to capture uh, both scale, you know, scale and scope efficiencies and, and operational uh, per performance. Um, there, there are models out there. I, you know, I've, I, I'm sorry, one last side is I just feel like, you know, we, we have, I feel like I'm hearing the same record playing over and over and over in my head, you know. I mean, I've been at this conversation before. And we don't lack ideas. We don't lack innovation. I don't even think we lack incentives. People say that. I don't think that's true. I think we lack capacities. I think we lack, you know, the, the institutional and uh, practical operational capacity to put things in place. And I'll stop. I'm sorry. Damien, can I can I come and yeah? Oh, sure, uh, sure. Um, no, I was from just Kendra, uh, go right ahead. Yeah, talked about getting municipalities to financing, whether it be federal financing. Uh, what you were just talking about the capacity. You know, it is important. And uh, Radhika, I think, mentioned in this as, as well is that. You know, we do need to build that capacity and we need to bring people together, you know, and what we're doing at EPA is, is funding environmental finance centers, we call them, technical assistance, mm -hmm. right? A hundred million dollars directly to lead people to SRF programs. You mentioned EPIC is one of our national uh, EFCs. U.S. Water Alliance is here as another of our national EFCs. We've got four national level ones and uh, several dozen smaller ones as well. But it's really about 
bringing the right solution, right? I, mean, I always talk about innovation. It's, it may be low-tech innovation, right? It may be bringing that skid-mounted unit. It may be, you know, it, whatever it is, is finding the right technical solution for them, putting in place a governance structure and an ongoing sustainable financing, fund, or funding, excuse me, funding from ratepayers or whatever the source is, so you maintain that, and leading them to the financing vehicle to, to bring that money in. So I, I, I it, think it's I'm very, it's, it has to be very intentional and, and um, Again, this is a one-time shop, but we have to take the opportunity to build a framework that's going to be existing after this yeah. funding is going. No, I, I hear you. I, I, we're probably at different ends on that, uh, Janice certainly, than me. Um, I think that we, when we look at uh, the, when we look at the world, I think the incentives for a government to say, "Here's the, the government can only do one one size fits all," the solutions are myriad. And I think the only way to get those solutions in there is to have private enterprise get involved. Part of, part of what we saw with deregulation of energy was a, a fear that prices would go through the roof. They didn't. We saw microgrids come in, and then we all, all of a sudden saw distributed energy. I think you're seeing with the connection, the overlay with, with energy, 40% of the cost of the utility is in energy, um, that you're going to get to that model. Dan, I think you would... You would uh, have some uh, discussion on that or some thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so I think whether it's Veolia, U.S. Water, from our standpoint, we can bring the tools, we can bring the technology. I think we can certainly partner with financial investors. We can put a package together that includes private equity, includes government debt, um, the challenge that we have, however, and, and I, I don't know how we overcome it, is navigating the political landscape. It's different in different places. Doing business in New York is very different than doing business in Florida, which is where most of our business is. And um, procurement barriers are a big, big challenge. And so... Um, how do you overcome that? Yeah, no. um, the, 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 Florida has uh, a law that enables unsolicited proposals, as an example. So folks from the private sector who have an idea in terms of how they could add value, bring value, and have that uh, process initiated through an unsolicited proposal, I think you've seen um, a recent uh, transaction that was just concluded in Fort Lauderdale um, that started with an unsolicited uh, proposal process. And so I think these are some of the key barriers that we're going to have to find a way to overcome. Yeah, go ahead. So um, one of the largest challenges that we find is municipalities are being asked, elected and appointed officials, are being asked to understand complex uh, contracts, complex, complex risk profiles that are associated with either design, build, finance, operate, maintain, design, build, operate, maintain, operate, maintain. And, and these people are elected to um, put forth the interest of the residents within their geographic boundary, right? That's it. They are not elected to raise rates in order to build the resiliency of their water system. And oftentimes you'll find if mayors are making decisions, for example, I want to set up a stormwater utility because I want to earn revenue to pay for cost to pump and route stormwater away from our streets and our houses so we don't flood. And that mayor gets kicked out of office the next time because the uh, the, uh, the um, the folks who live there don't want to pay for that. But then you fast forward 10 years and all of a sudden everyone's happy because there's not flooding. So you're asking, we are asking mayors and council members to make decisions that um, are not in their best interest either. So I would argue and be provocative and you got to blow up the whole way that we manage rates for water. You know, why don't you have uh, state PUC set rates for everyone? Take that responsibility away from the mayors and the city council members. They don't want that responsibility. It's an enormous headache. 
lake. I mean, and that goes for drinking water, wastewater, biosolids disposal. Biosolids disposal costs are going through the roof, and you need to have regional uh, solutions for that. And if you put the burden on the mayors and the city council members to understand these complex contracts and raise the rates, nothing's going to happen and nothing's going to change. So maybe it's what you were saying about having some sort of national federal water department to which these state PUCs are accountable and had accountable, and we're setting a national water strategy. I mean, look at China. They have five-year national uh, I, water strategies. This yeah. is a national security risk. I'm not certain yeah. why we in the U.S. are necessarily afraid. Um, around the world, uh, I was uh, invited by the U.S. Treasury Department in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where they were looking to privatize Sao Paulo, Brazil. Why is the U.S. government, U.S. Treasury in Sao Paulo, Brazil, looking to privatize Sao Paulo, yet we can't have those discussions here in the U.S.? You go around the world, the U.K. has the, the 70 plus percent of their water is privatized. Amman, Jordan, privatized. Uh, Philippines, uh, Manila, Philippines. I'm not certain why we in the U.S. necessarily have a fear of allowing the right side of the balance sheet, if you will, an allocation of risk and return to infiltrate a system that has been, that has been rated D minus by, uh, by the American Society of Civil Engineers. Yes. Yeah, I'd add Israel to the list, though. Pardon me? Uh, I'd add Israel to the list of one of the most innovative. Yeah, 70% uh, and, is and provided they, by one and company. And they pay a single tariff for the entire country, which is really interesting. Um, quick note, though, PUCs are not accountable to the federal government. They never not yet, they, right. No, not at all. Not, not ever. That's a constitutional question. They, they, that's not how, you know, so the federal government has uh, responsibility for interstate commerce. Interstate commerce is strictly at the, at the state level. I do appreciate the point, though, and I've actually suggested maybe they could pl play at least like an appeal, you know, role or something like that. But I want to go back to Jackson, Flint, and so on. You know, these are issues of poverty. These aren't issues of even you know managerial capacity. Not in the case of Jackson, they had access to one of the best water experts in the country. Um, so, you know, I think again, I, I, you want to be careful, and also making the analogy to energy. The portion of energy that was deregulated was generation, um, which you know was the major uh, deal. It has produced mixed results, some power plant efficiency, no doubt, but mixed results in terms of retail rates and retail competitions are real mixed bag. Um, and then, but in water systems, 67% of the cost is in transmission and distribution. So it's almost flipped. And that's where you have diseconomies of scale. Diseconomies. So, I mean, yes, if you can share a treatment plant, you can do things like that, you know, the, the, at the, in, the, in production and treatment, you gain. But these costs just don't go away. And I actually think energy, by the way, I think is going to approach the same thing. And I, I think in this country, we're going to pay face a very serious equity issue. How are we going to pay for infrastructure when the marginal cost is really low? We can't just send everybody a big, fat, fixed bill. That, that, I, did, I did talk about rate making. So, um, but, so I mean, I, we have to have the conversation. Storm, you, you said stormwater utility. Maybe it should be stormwater environmental services. Maybe it should be a hybrid system. You know, we, in other words, we've pushed ourselves into this water utility model. There are choices. There are choices in funding and there are choices in financing. And I think, I think again, let's have the conversation. Yeah. No, so, I, think, I think that's, that's right. I mean, that, that's the whole point here, though, is to have that conversation and to, to talk about that because there are, with the rise of um, infrastructure funds, the cost is lower. Uh, with the rise of enterprises that are looking at innovation in water, looking at AI, AIML, looking at how intelligence can be brought to the grid to make it more efficient. Um, and we're, we're, we're simply unable, with the current discussions around PPP, uh, to have those dialogues because part of it, I think, is uh, the red tape that both uh, Kendra and Dan alluded to, but more importantly, the sophistication and sophistry of a lot of the systems themselves just don't allow it. So I, I think you have some challenges, um, but I think that, that if we maintain the existing system, we're not going to get to those challenges. Yeah, I mean, it, 
you, you mentioned efficiency. I mean, I've been this business a long time, like a lot of us. I, there's still a lot of efficiency to be driven out of the system. I've mm -hmm. worked for the private sector, so as Veolia, you know, public utilities, even in the best utilities, there's an astounding amount of efficiency. If you look at it holistically, all the way from planning and design uh, to rate structures um, and capital. Uh, so I think that's, that's on us, and, and, and it's also on us as, as water leaders to work with the governing bodies because we're not going to... So, so why, why don't we have a dialogue about the value of water? Why, why is it... Why, you look yeah, well, at... I think everyone, everyone assumes and knows the value yeah, of I mean, water. I mean, to monetize it, kind of like you did, which is what is the, what is the cost of not doing things correctly? Businesses but, do that all the time. I mean, yeah. why are businesses embracing circularity? Why are they outsourcing theirs? You know, it's the same water. Well... I think one of the underlying aspects of the way that our current water system, the way that water is currently managed, that everyone is touching on so far, is utilities are actually disincentivized from future investments. They're incentivized, as you mentioned, to keep costs low. That's what we saw in Jackson. We've seen that in a lot of these headline-making water tragedies, is that for years there's been this disinvestment from utilities because they're incentivized to keep their you know, rate payers happy and, and keep costs low. And as Radhika Fox mentioned earlier, even in a lot of these places, if they could raise rates without getting kicked out of office, there's an affordability issue. And are we saying that we're willing to live in a country where if, say, you get sick and you're paying for chemo and your water bill is high and you can't afford to pay it, your water bill gets shut off? Is that... If we're talking about no, water no. as a human right, then we need to accept that there's, there's things that need to prevent water shutoffs, and it, it's not just an economic so, force. So I, think, so I think part of the answer to that is we have the same issue with, with uh, energy. You have backstops, and maybe the government can provide backstops in that area. But you know, that, that's not the reason not to do it. I think one that happens in municipalities in particular, and again, I'm, I'm staying away from industrial uh, and, and ag right now, but what happens in the muni side of things is when you hear that and you push up against it, these aren't their systems that they, they are familiar with, they're too complex. So where do they, where do they cut back the corners? On O&M. And that's why we have all the deferred maintenance issues, that's why we had a D minus associated with it because their only tool that they control is O&M. They've outsourced the funding of it. We do have an interesting contrast between cities, who, some of whom, let's be careful, you know, we overgeneralize so much in this field. I mean, I've lived in different cities. I've always had great service that made great investments, you know, so let's be careful about that. But some cities do avoid, the, they want to avoid the politics of rate increases. We have the flip side problem with investor-owned utilities because our, our rate-based rate of return model strongly incentivizes investment. And we probably have some uneconomic capital investment, as well as p perhaps lack of um, incentives unless regulators are, do are effective and doing a good job. Um, you know, we can have some inefficiencies there as well. And so I think, again, we, we have to be really, really careful. I think we have to revisit, you know, what a prudent utility looks like today. And um, I think all water systems, and this is where, again, the philanthropy and the, and the experts can come into play, should be re-optimized. These systems, we know this. They were built out in a crazy quilt pattern, right, over many years, depending on who was here and who was there and what business was there. And so we know there's just a lot under the, under the ground there. There are models that will say upsize over here, downsize over here, relocate or, or, or abandon this, this area. And we can save a ton. So this is what I worry about with the ACE numbers. Do they say that, ACE? Uh, whatever. Um, that they, they are, seem to be presuming in-kind replacement. Well, that's crazy. That, that would be just a terrible uh, way to go. And that's why I'm hoping, you know, um, EPA and others will, you know, will ask. And regulators, what have you done to optimize? Yeah, and I, when I see a lot of the estimates for future investments, I always say you're basing on how we built in 1972. You know, I mean, why, why are we designing, building like we did all those, all those years, right? We, we should have learned something. Tomorrow's infrastructure to back yesterday's... Back, maybe to that's, the, where, that's where the, the, the current federal and state gov funding is allocated towards, is perpetuating a system... Well, it doesn't have to. That's the thing, though. I mean, it's, it, the funding is, 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 you know, 
as, as neutral as to how it's being used. So we, we, you know, but we should take more leadership in trying to encourage that. Again, right. encourage. We can't demand, we can't insist based on our system of government. But because you, you've got, like I said, it's not their business. Yeah. The municipal yeah. government is yeah. not in the business of making water. But get back to the public and private briefly. You know, I think we need to look at it from a risk management standpoint. I go way back to the beginning when I was the public-private partnership guy as a much younger man at UPA many years ago. Um, when we started looking at that, and I remember my boss at the time, and it was privatization kind of at the time. Was, that was when it was privatization. People were looking, interested was there. in buying systems. And my boss at the time said, you know, it's, it's not that unusual. When, when we went to biosolids, what we called sludge back then, we started managing sludge back in the 70s and whatnot. You know, it was not core to the utilities, wastewater utilities. Like, we don't manage this. So that, there's this whole, I mean, Ogden, Willebrader, all this whole private sector came in to, to manage sludge and whatnot. Communities were offloading risk that they didn't understand, did not want to undertake. So if, if we look at it, it's not ideological. Look at it from a risk management standpoint. What is the best, who can best manage those risks? There will be many times when the private sector is best to manage those risks um, and, and other times where it's not. So I think we need to kind of look at it as, is, is the, the entity, the utility, looking at how best we deliver these services as most efficiently as possible and taking into account the long-term risk, whether it be handling solids or the risk of not investing and, and having your system fall apart. That's also a huge risk that needs to be managed. Yeah. I, I also think there's a huge role and opportunity for private investment in terms of being a catalytic mover forward, <laughs> um, to put it ineloquently, right? But the federal government can support innovation, but I think that private investment has a very unique opportunity to do proof of concept, innovation, catalytic funding um, that can really move us forward as a nation in a way that government and local entities can support and continue to drive forward, but maybe it won't be taking those first steps. But how, how do you monetize that value? How do you do that in fight, if you may, against the perception that water should be free? Um, that, you know, ratepayers can't afford to pay more. The flip side is more expensive, obviously. So there has to be a trade-off here. There has to be a way for the private sector to be able to monetize some of those benefits. It's a, it's a great point. It's a great question. And in case anyone hasn't thought about the Roman Empire yet today, um, back to the Roman Empire, <laughs> they had a, a great system. Or, you know, even back that far, they had a system for providing water to people at a, a free cost for all citizens. And for those that wanted and were able to pay more to have it, you know, better, better service levels, right? They could at that time it was in their homes, they could have water piped into their homes. So I would argue that in America today, everyone should have water piped into their homes, but there's still people who are always going to be willing to pay more for better quality service that still provides a basic level of access to everyone. It, it, just real quick, Michael, we're running out of time. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. yeah I was just saying, you're talking about the value of water, and you reminded me of this, is that until recently I served on the Board of Directors for Water for People. And I remember, I still remember going to like Bolivia, you know, where uh, you know, a small community, maybe 30 homes or whatnot, are built with help this water system. And, and um, you know, two well houses up on the hillside. And they, they put in place a rate structure, right, including capital reserves of 5,000 US dollars for 30 communities after they built this little system because they knew that one of those pumps was going to go down one day and they needed to replace it. And I told the leader of that community, I want to bring you back to the United States because I have mayors of major cities who say, oh, who would have thought that pump would have gone out? And the only solution for me is to go to Congress and ask for money, right? I mean, it's, it, we have to take responsibility. People who, do, who don't have clean water and sanitation know the value of it. They're willing to pay for it. They're willing to pay dearly for it because they know the consequences of their sick children not being able to have an economy. And so, you know, again, let's, let's you know, all recommit to making, making that education. And, and let's talk a little bit about, you know, these, some of these communities, these rural communities, um, that don't have water or, or have poor, poor water systems. Water, energy, and economic development are intertwined. One of the things you can look at with, you know, real estate development, with, with industrial development, is how do you put that all together so that those communities that are lesser developed can have a vibrant economy and attract industry and attract jobs? 
it all starts with water. We have at, at our law firm, we have a very vibrant um, economic development um, uh, practice. Um, first thing everybody comes for billion dollar plants. The first question, and for smaller plants too, the first question they ask is what's the water situation? So part of it is, is, is you can't uh, avoid the economic question to dis when you're discussing what the value of water is and how to access it to those folks. So, um, and quickly, Mike, Michael yeah. kind of highlighted the value of collaboration and public-public partnerships. And so again, you know, I'm, I'm involved in a couple of research projects in the Detroit area, you know, looking for ways to you know bring stakeholders together to understand the value of collaboration. To, yeah. You know, that will enable technology and also risk risk management. I think resilience, Michael, will drive uh, drive that in the climate climate uh, context. Well, it, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, again, this was meant to, to, to give you a, a landscape of what's out there right now from a financing standpoint. I can recall in 2019 going to a, a water conference, and one of, the, uh, one of the working groups they had was a lawyer and a city uh, manager go into a bar and come out with a PPP contract. <laughs> That's the way. It was, and that's the way I think, unfortunately, it still is today. We really need to get a more dialogue around the value of water, and you'll hear more about that uh, from the folks in the Middle East coming out today. Um, I think we have a lot of capital right now that's looking for homes, both from the federal government and the local area, philanthropic organizations, private organizations, private equity, that we need to start having those considered dialogues rather than having some jaundiced view of privatization, affirmage, a concession. Um, so with that, I think we're on time maybe.